Good day, everyone, and welcome to our first Philippine Nursing Town Hall Conference. May invite everyone in prayer. Shall we pray? Creator, sustainer of every good and perfect gift, as we gather today, we thank you for the blessings of togetherness. Thank you for the privilege of studying our chosen areas and gaining new skills amidst the threat. We pray that as we continue with our conference, we may use this platform and knowledge to go out and bless the world. Foster within us a continued passion for learning as we journey onwards. Bless our speakers, so whatever significance to thy listeners. Supreme Being, enlighten our hearts in love to be attentive and grant us receptive minds to comprehend the matters at hand. Make us aware that in our work, we bring your work to completion. Amidst these trying times, remind us to be grateful for the work we do and keep us cooperative with our stakeholders and sympathetic people we serve. Fix our sight on you, our guiding light, to grant us hope as we play towards a time to us. This is our prayer. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to this inaugural project of the Philippine Nursing Town Hall Meeting. This event is envisioned to advance the nursing practice in the country, which brings decision makers from the different parts of the Philippines, especially on the emerging issues related to the practice of nursing profession. Today's undertaking is anchored on the premise of looking into the state of challenges and opportunities for Filipino nurses, organized by the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network. Joel. Joel. Okay, go ahead. Before we go further, let me review the functionality of the Zoom platform. Your active participation is essential throughout the session. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avert background noise that may distract you from listening. Throughout the presentation, someone of the staff will be managing the chat functionality. You can enter questions and comments in the question box throughout the presentation. If you would rather ask that in person, you may also use the icon on the control panel to raise your hand, indicating that you have something to ask. Once you raise your hand, someone will unmute your line so that you can ask your question. As a disclaimer, the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network assumes no responsibility for speakers, guests, or consequences resulting from the use of information or content of such information presented, including but not limited to errors or omissions, the accuracy or the reasonableness of factual or scientific assumptions, studies or conclusions, the defamatory nature of statements, ownership of copyright or other intellectual and the violation of property, privacy, or personal rights of others. Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network is not responsible for and expressly disclaims all liability for damages of any kind arising out of use, reference to, or reliance on such information. While well, the speaker makes every effort to present accurate and reliable information, Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network does not endure, approve, or certify such information, nor does it guarantee the accuracy, efficacy, completeness, timeliness, or correct sequencing of such information. All presentations, 
represent the opinions of the presenter and do not represent the position or opinion of the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network or its members. Reference by the speaker to any specific commercial product, process, or service by trade name, trademark, service mark, manufacturer, and corporation or otherwise does not constitute or imply endorsement, recommendation, or favoring by Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network. To formally open this program, allow me to introduce a researcher, peer reviewer, and educator for the last 45 years. Prior to her administrative position as Director of Research on the Alice Lee Center for Nursing Studies in the National University of Singapore, she shared her leadership skills gained administrative competence and her teaching career in 1988 at the University of Sydney and in 1997 to 2005 at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. In the year 2009 to 2013, she was appointed as professor at the Australian National University in Canberra and the Australian Capital Territory Health Directorate. Director of the Research Center for Nursing and Midwifery. With more than 100 journal articles and counting, her research has prompted her to be invited as keynote and plenary speaker in a number of international conferences. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome the President of the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, Dr. Violeta Lopez, for her words of welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all participants around the globe. I hope that you will have a good two-hour session with us. As some of you may not know, uh, the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network was established in nine, uh, 2018. And our vision is to enhance the role of uh, Filipino nurses worldwide and to promote and provide a venue for discussion with each other about innovative uh, processes to think about what would be a constructive ideas to further promote the work of the Filipino nurses in meeting the health needs of the people they serve wherever they are. The year 2020 is really significant for us because it marks the International Year of the Nurses and Midwives. To celebrate and to put nurses at the forefront of the Global National Center for Health Policy and for Workforce. 2020 is also a significant year for us because the state of the World Nursing Report was just launched in collaboration with the World Health Organization and the International Council of Nurses with its 191 uh, state members. The report describes the what, why, how, when, and with whom the nursing workforce will help deliver the health uh, international or uh, universal health coverage, as well as to meet the uh, sustainable development goals within the next three to five years. There are three major things that the report actually highlighted. First one, of course, is the uh, workforce issues about nurses because they envisage that there will be a significant shortfall of nurses in 2030. They also highlighted practice as they found out in this um, discussion and survey that only 6% of nurses actually perform roles uh, regarding health promotion, disease prevention, and rehabilitation care. They also highlight policy options 
for investment in nursing education, research, and leadership. With all these three main things highlighted in the report, research into nursing workforce is needed globally with regards to the number of nurses, the types of nurses, the education, regulation, practice, leadership, as well as gender issues. So I hope what you will hear today from our three uh, in speakers would actually provide you with some of their views on this um, 2020 State of the World Nursing Report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lopez, for the words of welcome. At this juncture, let us be inspired by the words from our invited guests. First, allow me to introduce a health and business professional finishing his Doctor of Medicine at the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. He is also a registered business professional from the Chartered Association of Marketing and Business Professionals and a registered nurse from the University of the Philippines, Manila, who received his Master's in Business Administration from Ateneo de Manila University. A fellow of the Royal Institute for Nurses, a former Youth Power Global Leader of Restless Development International, former lead convener of the SDG Youth National Convergence, former technical working group member of UN Population Fund Philippines, and one of the top five United States Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative Top Future Professionals. He currently serves as the SDG3 Ambassador of the 2030 Youth Force in the Philippines Incorporated SDG3 Youth Champion of the 2030 Project, co-head of the Happy Hour Mental Health Initiative, and director for strategy of the Youth for Mental Health Coalition. Concurrently, he also works as executive vice president for branding and communications of IPG Training Institute for Professional Advancement and research consultant of Healthcare Without Harm Asia. With over eight years of consultancy and executive experience in civil society organizations and the private sector, he has been nominated to the Leadership Council of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Youth Philippines. In April 2019, he was appointed by the President as a member of the Board of Commissioners of the Commission on Population and Development, PAPCOM, under the National Economic and Development Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, help me in welcoming Commissioner Dexter Galban. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Ako po si Commissioner Dexter Galban ng Commission on Population and Development o POPCO. Ako po ay isang nurse at ako po ay nagpapasalamat sa Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network para sa pagkakataong ito. Ngayon po nakikita natin ang ating mga kapwa nurse ang backbone at lakas ng ating healthcare system dito sa Pilipinas. Patuloy po tayo nakikipaglaban sa COVID-19 kasama ang iba pang frontliners kagaya ng ating mga doktor at iba pang healthcare workers. Pero mukha po yata itinadhana na ang panahong ngayon ay ang taong 2020 na tinaguri ang Year of the Nurse ng World Health Organization. Ito po marahil ay dahil tayo ang tumatayong pinakamatinding depensa laban sa pandemyang ito. Ayon po sa State of the World Nursing Report, kinakailangan na po nating alalahanin kung bakit nga ba mahalaga at espesyal ang ating mga nurse. Tayo po ang tinatawag nilang care specialist. Hindi lamang po gamot, hindi lang po test, hindi lang po payo ang binibigay po natin sa ating mga pasyente. Ang haplos po ng pagmamahal at akay ng pag-aaruga ang tunay nating hinahatid sa ating mga pasyente. Sa panahon ngayon, kinakailangan na po nating ipaglaban ang ating mga karapatan bilang mga nurse, lalong-lalo na sa tamang trabaho, tamang sweldo at tamang benepisyo. Ang 2020 po ay Year of the Nurse. 
Isa po itong paalala na kailangan na po nating magkaisa upang itaguyod ang ating profesyon. Ang profesyon ng nursing na nag-aalaga sa ating mga pasyente. Tandaan po natin na ang mga nurse ay patuloy pong nagsasakripisyo, naglilingkod at nagbibigay alaga sa ating mga kapwa Pilipino. At ngayon po ay napapanahon na na ang mga nagbibigay alaga ay bigyan din ng pansin at bigyan din po ng alaga. Maraming maraming salamat po at mabuhay ang nursing sa Pilipinas. Another guest to motivate all of us is a commissioner of the Philippine Commission on Women. She is also the CEO of the Community Health Education Emergency Response Services, or the CHEERS Foundation, that provides training in emergency medical services across the nation. The social enterprise has trained over 35,000 healthcare professionals and ordinary people all over the world. She was named the first ASEAN Woman Leader Awardee by the ASEAN Business Advisory Council for her efforts. Let us welcome our colleague in the nursing profession, Commissioner Sandy Montano. Hello everyone, my fellow nurses, my colleagues in the nursing service. I'm Commissioner Sandy Sanchez Montano saying that we would like to welcome you in this Philippine Nursing Town Hall meeting wherein we discuss the state challenges and opportunities of Filipino nurses here and abroad in this pandemic COVID-19 time. Um, we know for a fact that we play a very big role when it comes to uh, the healthcare system in the whole world. That's why it is very timely that we discuss what are the fears, anxieties, and the future of our nursing profession. Thank you and have a nice day. Bye. At this point, I am privileged to introduce to you our facilitator for today's meeting. He is a professor of nursing at the Institute of Biomedical Sciences, Tokushima University Graduate School, Japan. A professor emeritus of Florida Atlantic University, Christine Eileen College of Nursing in Boca Raton, Florida, and holds visiting professorial positions at various colleges of nursing in Thailand, Uganda, and the Philippines. As a theorist and nursing scholar of caring science, he authored a middle-range theory, Technological Competency as Caring in Nursing, published by the Sigma Theta Tau International Press in 2005 with Japanese translation in 2009. A Fulbright Scholar to Uganda, recipient of the Fulbright Alumni Initiative Award and the Fulbright Senior Specialist in Global and Public Health and International Development. Our facilitator is a board member of the Anne Boykin Institute for the Advancement of Caring in Nursing and the International Association of Human Caring. He directs the Technological Competency as Caring in Nursing Institute at Tokushima University a member of the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering and was inducted fellow of the American Academy of Nursing in 2006. I am very honored to introduce our inaugural facilitator for today's town hall meeting, Dr. Rosano Luxin. Hi, uh, good afternoon, good evening and good morning to all. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ako, for introducing me. Uh, Today is an auspicious occasion for nurses in the Philippines and in the diaspora. We are honored to have with us today three eminent guests who have distinguished themselves as leaders in the Philippine nursing. As the focus of the first envisioned series of town hall meetings, these leaders will share with us their experiences, goals, strategies to succeed, in their respective areas of practice, as well as discuss com commentaries and reactions of other experts, and finally, entertain questions to educate our fellow Philippine nurses in the global arena. 
<laughs> and welcome our eminent guest with us today. Um, can I ask those whose microphones are still on uh, if you want to mute it? Okay. Um, again, may I welcome the eminent guests who are here with us today, uh, Dr. Maria Linda Buhat, President of the Association of Nursing Supervisors and Administrators of the Philippines, or ANSAP, Dr. Leah Pakis, representing the Ang Nurse Portalist and representative to the Philippine Congress, and Dr. Irma Bukamante, President of the Philippine Nursing Research Society. These eminent guests represent the first three areas that the Filipino nursing in the diaspora has found critically significant to address the strategic goals of the WHO 2020 State of the World's Nursing Report. So, uh, the program will transpire like this, right? First, we have recorded, uh, pre-recorded content by each of the three eminent uh, guests. Then we will ask each, after each of their presentations, an update, all right? Because these uh, record, pre-recorded pre um, uh, presentations were done about uh, three, four weeks ago. So they may have some updates. So we'll have them to do that. After all the presentations have been done and updates made, we will proceed with commentaries, well, commentaries to pre-recorded comments through the YouTube. We will have live reactions from three renowned experts for each of the topic areas. And then we will go into pre-recorded questions submitted online through chat box by those who had the opportunity to view the online presentations. And finally, but not the least, actually it's the best, is the live Q&A, all right? So now uh, let us have the pre-recorded presentation of Dr. Maria Linda Buhat, president of ANSA. Improving sub public understanding of the importance of safe staffing. These are my references. Staffing is the process of determining and providing the acceptable number of mix of nursing personnel to produce a desired level of care to meet the patient's demands. So appropriate number of qualified and skilled mixed nursing staff leads to improve safety and quality patient care. These are the principles of nursing staffing. We have patient care related, staff related, and institutional or organizational related. Under patient related, we have the number of patients in the unit, the intensity level of or acuity level of patients. And in staff related is the preparation, the experience, or the competencies of the nurses. And in the organizational related is the contextual issues including the architectural design of the unit, and the available resources, and the available technology. And the relationship of staffing to patient outcome, clinical outcome, and safety outcome, I have identified six factors. Improvement of the overall health status, achievement of appropriate self-care, patient length of stay, health-related quality of life, patient perception of being well cared of, and errors in care which are preventable. The, this is the um, ratio of nurses per population. So in 2017 and in 2018, in 2018 alone, if we have estimated population of the Philippines is 100 million, and the number of nurses is only 87,000, and so therefore the ratio is only 8.53%, which is not the ideal setting. In the hospital, the nurse to patient ratio is per acuity level of care. We have four levels, one, two, three, and four. In adult, we have different from pediatrics because pediatrics is difficult to handle than adult. So for level one alone, we have one is to 12, and uh, one is to six, one is to one, or up to three. The nurse can handle up to three patient for level three. And for level four, one is to one, or two nurses to one patient. In pediatric, one is to eight, one is to four, one is to one, or two, one is to one, or two is to one. However, this is not uh, re the reality in the Philippines. In other hospital, one nurse can handle in level one, one is to 20 patient. And in other hospital also, for pediatrics, one nurse can only handle six patients. 
For the operating room, of course, we know that we need a scrub and circulator, so it's two nurses and one patient. For COVID, for probable and suspect, one to four patient. For confirmed cases, one nurse to two patient. However, for intubated, we need at least two nurses in one patient or one is to one depending on acuity level of care. So therefore, nursing is a critical factor in determining the quality of care in the hospital and the nature of patient outcomes according to Nancy Donaldson. And so in the Philippines, which is known for competent and compassionate nurses and is employed to all corners of the world, since 2017, to present, we are shorthanded. Why? Because of the change of educational system, that, wa that is why there is a decline of enrollment from 2019, coronavirus disease, better staffing ratio. There is an estimated shortage of 23 nurses nationwide, according to PHAPI. And these are the factors that affect employee retention, the job, culture, personal, and external. The challenges, the total number of registered nurses who migrated temporarily from 1992 to 2017 alone is 285,000, and those migrated permanently is 46,000. The number of nurses who were employed within a year from their graduation is 16% only of the current manpower, and the half shortage of hospital, the private, is 26%, and in the government is 35.55%. The turnover rate in hospital is 16.64 in 2017 and in 2018, 16.5%. The reasons or inner issues and concern is increasing international demand for nurses, broad gap in salaries between local and international employment, silent underemployment, and risk of this killing. So therefore, we have to take care of our nurses because we are first and foremost human beings caring for human beings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Buhat. Uh, that was uh, inspiring. Uh, I like the statistical data. It has uh, informed me a lot. Uh, would you have any additional update or information that you will have uh, uh, updates to what you have presented. Dr. Buhat? Yeah, come again. Uh, do you have any updates to what you have just presented? Uh, the pre-recorded data? Uh -huh. No, actually we don't, I don't have the, uh, I have searched for the new updates and the new data, but that is the latest data that I can get. Excellent, okay. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Buhat. Now we shall have um, Dr. Leah Pakis, who is um, the representative uh, of the Ang Nurse Party List, right? Dr. Pakis, uh, pre recorded uh, presentation, please. Oh, I work. Yes. I'm Dr. Leah Pakis, representative. 16th Congress of Angnars Party List and the President of Angnars. Nursing is the single most important factor involved in patient satisfaction in every part of the hospital. Delivery of nursing care in hospital setting may be heading to the perfect storm. The delivery of safe, quality care will result to a perfect storm if leadership and management of the nursing staff, nursing services and linkages with other health workers will be under persons who are not care specialists or the nurses. Storms will pass by if a chief nursing officer a CNO with a nursing office will conduct the baton. It is the CNO who is responsible for management representation, policy implementation, expertise of the staff, intensity of nursing care, 
staffing decisions, evaluation of competency level, conditions of work like salaries, security of tenure, and benefits, nurse-patient ratios, considering patient characteristics, context of the unit like geographic dispersion of patients, size and layout of individual patient rooms, arrangement of entire patient care unit, and technology. In 2011, I visited a hospital in Capiz Leyte. I was astounded when the human resource officer told me that he is the chief nurse of the said hospital. I politely asked him three questions. Sir, may I know if you have a Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree? Did you pass the nurse licensure examination? He arrogantly said, no. Then sir, you are not qualified because you are not a registered nurse. He was silent. Sir, may I know why you said you are the chief nurse? He said, because our chief nurse here is not knowledgeable, no leadership and management skills, and no assertiveness. But I was more shocked when I learned that many hospitals removed the nursing offices and the chief nursing officer sent positions and put the nurses again in the office of the medical director. In the Department of Health, there is no chief nursing officer and no nursing office. Same with many hospitals in the country. It dawned on me that if we will not have a law on chief nursing officers and provision of nursing offices, then the leadership and governance of nurses will be lost again to the medical directors. That is why when I personally authored and filed House Bill 151, the Comprehensive Nursing Law Bill, CNL, in the 16th Philippine Congress in 2013, I included the CNOs and nursing offices in hope to institutionalize them legally. It is stated in Article 9, Section 46, Nursing Service Office and the Chief Nursing Officer. There shall be a nursing service office in every health institution, be it administrative or clinical, with at least 10 nurses. The nursing service office must be under the control and management of a chief nursing officer. The nursing service and delivery of healthcare in the private and public health practice or community settings must be under the control and management of the chief nursing officer or the chief nurse. The CNO shall carry full administrative responsibility and shall have the authority over the planning, organizing, directing, and controlling of the nursing human resources under the nursing service. The CNO shall be responsible for the formulation of policies, strategic and operational planning, financial and resource allocation, policies and procedures development, professional and organizational involvement to address epidemiologic problems. The CNO shall also provide statistical data, exercise good governance, and assume accountability and responsibility for the nursing personnel in both private and public health care and community settings. The CNO shall also act as the advocate for the rights and welfare of nurses. A CNO must be qualified and credentialed 
based on the policies, standards, and guidelines promulgated by the regulatory board. We lobbied and shepherded this bill and was given the leadership responsibility by Congress to chair the technical working group with representatives Carlos Padilla, Rufus Rodriguez, and Maximo Rodriguez as members. It was approved by both houses, Congress and Senate. However, the Philippine Hospital Association lobbied against the approval of the CNL and put one page ad in the newspaper for President Benigno Aquino to veto the said bill. DOI Secretary Garin also lobbied for its veto. And much to our dismay, it was vetoed in 2016 by President Pinoy. These provisions of having a CNO and nursing office in the Department of Health, Public Health Nursing, be it occupational, school nursing in LGUs, and hospitals are over the country will lead to sustainable human development, efficient, effective safety and quality services where respected nurses with dignity will be partners of the government in strong nation building. A nurse party list won a seat in Congress in 2013. Its mantra, nangangalaga ng tagapag-alaga ng may sakit because it believes walang kalusugan kung walang mag-aalaga sa kalusugan ng bayan. We worked against exploitation, false volunteerism, and false trainings. Through its efforts, we were able to make Makati Medical Center return 2 million to nurses for, for false training fees. We actualized the revision of Annex C of DOH Administrative Order 2012-0012, which now includes nurses will work for nurses to deliver normal babies and operate their own birthing homes. We work hard for PhilHealth Cellular number 2017-0023 for the accreditation of nurses for maternal and child health services. We also work for IV therapy that is now no more a requirement for employment for nurses. We erase the policy that IV therapy training is a license according to one resolution number 38. All in-service trainings required by the institution should be paid by the institution. One resolution number 31. We brought special professional licensure board examinations, SPLBE, for nurses, architects, and engineers to Saudi Arabia. We spearheaded the provision of the Joint Manual of Operations in providing assistance to migrant workers and other Filipinos overseas by filing HR. 1431 as a concrete action responding to the needs of our repatriated nurses from Libya. We worked and won against the ban of OFWs to work abroad during the COVID-19 infestation. We worked for C PCMC, Philippine Children's Medical Center's land, not to be sold. We also worked for field health dialysis from 45 to 90 per year. We were the primary author of RA 10643, the Graphic Health Warning Law. In 2019, a nurse list won its certiorari and mandamus in the Supreme Court fighting for the implementation of salary grade 15 for nurses because in RA 9173 that was signed in 2002, it was written there that salary grade 15 should be the starting salary, but 
for all these years, it has never been given. The victory of the Angaris Party List case versus Executive Secretary, Department of Health, and DPM was made possible because it is no other than the Supreme Court that recognized the representation of representative PACIS as the representative of nurses. The Supreme Court declared that interest in the subject matter of the petition was direct and personal. In the case before us, Representative Bakis is duly elected as party list representative of a nurse party list which seeks to be the voice of the nurses in the country. Although she will not suffer direct injury because of the non-implementation of RA number 9173, her interest is direct in so far as she is the duly elected representative of nurses in the country. As such, the court recognizes Representative Pakis' legal standing to file this petition on behalf of her constituents who are directly affected by the non-implementation of Section 32 of RA 9173. Because of weak support of Amnar's party list constituents, it lost in the 2016 and 2019 elections. It has not stopped advocating for nurses and health workers and will continue till it reach its vision of tamang trabaho, tamang sweldo, tamang solusyon para sa kalusugan ng bayan. Our call to action Cannot hear anything, but Doctor Luxin? Yes. Okay, uh Doctor Pak is done. Yeah, but we cannot hear anything. The last part we couldn't hear, so yeah, I can I, uh, Dr. Yeah. Luxin, can I just read the call to action? Am I? No, go ahead. Yes. Time? Uh, I'm, I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry, Dr. Pakis. Uh, there was a big silence. So, okay. So, thank you. We, we need your updates, uh, Dr. Dr. Okay. Our yes. call to action. All nurses should grasp the needed knowledge and explain the importance of having a chief nursing officer in a nursing office. Okay. Lobby to have their own CNO and nursing office. Pass a bill into law for the provision of chief nursing office and a chief nursing officer. Strengthen CNOs in their respective institutions 
and make them accountable to their office responsibilities and the nurses they serve. We will have all eternity to celebrate the victories, but only a few hours before sunset to win them. Okay. Who should lead the nurses? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, inspiring thought, uh, call to action, uh, Dr. Pakis. Okay. Uh, wonder wonderfully stated. So uh, very interesting because uh, about three days ago, we were the, the fine uh, directors uh, they were discussing about this this particular idea of the chief nursing officer. Right. So now we would like to proceed and uh, go to Dr. Irma Bustamante, who will who, who will present about uh, their uh, contributions to the Philippine Nursing Research Society Incorporated. Right. So Dr. Bustamante is here, but he she is she has her own uh, PowerPoint presentation. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, let me check on this. Sorry for that. I'm not, I'm not sh hmm. I don't know how. It's playing. It's playing. Can you hear? No, nothing. Oh my goodness. Let me, let me screen share again. Sorry. We'll try again. Sharing what I have noted the Nursing Research Society. Everybody, my name is Marie Irma Bustamante. Currently, okay. I'm the president of the Philippine Nursing Research Society. And I'm going to give a talk on how nurse researchers conduct studies that make significant contributions to the Philippine healthcare. Let me start by first sharing what I have noticed in the 40 years of experience that I've had as a nurse, both as an educator and as a nurse practitioner. Many nurses felt that research actually is difficult and challenging to do. Why? Because it needs time. And many times, this time when uh, it's needed, when people do research because it is outside of their working hours. Then secondly, they see it as difficult because there should be administrative support. But nowadays, many health institutions, education and practice have what we call as research departments, which are now headed by very good research department heads. And they have their own principles and procedures to follow. And many of the nurses are now interested in this. Another one is, of course, there must be adequate budget. This is the problem now because many hospitals, many schools, or health institutions for that matter, really lack adequate budget. But aside from the budget, it's also important that resources are available, like internet connections. Some of, of course, many, many institutions now have internet connections. However, some still have, do not have linkages to ones which we need for our literature review. Examples of this are the Signal. Of course, Google Scholar is always there and it's free. We also have uh, NCBI. We also have Sage Publications. We have Elsevier and other databases. And of course, personal laptops are also important for nurses to have. However, many nurses nowadays do possess personal laptops. Now, what are the topics done by nurses? Well, I have noticed that many nurses do works on employment, especially on job placements and going abroad. And of course, on job satisfaction. Why? Because Many nurses take up nursing, to be very honest, because they want to go abroad. And when they want to go abroad, they want to work in hospitals. And they have to look at their salaries and benefits. However, nowadays, many nurses are employed not as nurses in hospitals that they expected, but in day, uh, either daycare centers for pediatrics or especially for the elderly. And, and these are very good topics for research, which many nurses are now doing, especially the ones who are doing 
their masters and PhDs. There, are, there is also now a change in our educational system, changes in both teaching and learning. We have OBE from our previous curriculum. So students now and even nurses in education are looking at training and OBE and the other curriculum and how it can help teaching and learning. Of course, there are also topics on knowledge, skills, attitudes, and practices on health and illness, like very popular cancer, cardiopulmonary system, skeletal, integumentary system, and other systems like kidney, liver, pancreatic, and GI system. Nowadays, infectious and communicable diseases are on the rise. So therefore, many nurses are doing studies like the very common COVID-19 disease now. And there's also the emerging and re-emerging diseases like now the Philippines have polio again. And we also look at over and under nutrition, especially now that many people are not working. So many children go under nutrition and people talk about diet. Other research topics done by nurses are uh, related to pediatrics up to geriatrics and also very important maternal and child health. Community health issues on health promotion and disease prevention are also very common, especially with the use of traditional methods like herbal medications, which the Department of Health is encouraging. Mental health, common now, the chemical abuse that many people are youth, many people, especially the youth are into, are also common topics of research. Many nurses also do studies on behaviors of Filipinos as patients or as carers. Carers are the ones who take care of the patient because you know here in the Philippines, the carers or the significant others watch over the patients and definitely the caregivers who are this, the nurses and even the doctors. With a rise of nursing, independent nursing interventions are also being done by many nurses, especially on health teachings. Now, end-of-life issues have always been a controversial topic for nurses. These are also being done. Do we still uh, do we need euthanasia? What do we do? Do we follow uh, the patient's rights or the patient's wishes? Treatment of illnesses like complementary and alternative therapies are also common topics done by nurses. And of course, we have gender and inequality issues, especially the, with the rise and our respect for the LGBTQIA community. And of course, the never-ending issue of colonialism where Filipinos really would like to change their citizenship and go abroad are also good topics. Of course, lastly, the general topics by, done by nurses are caring, loving, compassion, sympathy and empathy, the service that we give to others, ethics in nursing, and because of the Marawi siege, the indigenous health and practices of our indigenous people are also being studied, studied also. Now for rural health and urban migration, it means that many people leave the rural areas and go to the urban areas to be able to practice. And that is what we are seeing now as a problem in our fight against COVID-19. And very popular nowadays is the social networking. The role of media has also played an important role on our researches. However, how do nurses now help in healthcare? This is the main issue of the talk. Of course, it's not only doing research that is important. It is also disseminating our studies, both internally and externally, and both local and international. We need to publish in journals like the Philippine Journal of Nursing and other journals, but it is actually very, very, uh, I would say challenging because publications and writing needs a lot of skills and also time. Although it's quite very expensive because of the, our lifelong learning and the rise of our continuing professional development, nurses do have to attend conferences, both oral and poster presentation, and present their studies. Definitely, how will we help healthcare? We have to send letters to our administration and politicians of the results of our studies so that they will be the one to probably enact the law and use the findings of our studies. Now, 
we have to join professional organizations and interest groups like the group that I'm in now, the Philippine Nursing, the Philippine Nursing PNRSI. And of course, nurses can do pamphlets and handouts too based on the results of their studies. And these pamphlets and handouts provide health education. Of course, we use media also in all forms. Nurses are now being interviewed in radio and television, and they can now disseminate the findings of their studies to help in healthcare. Now, I have made a diagrammatic representation very simple. First, nurses really need to do research. Why? Because the results of these studies may influence people. And in influencing people, people may be, it's colored pink, in the pink of hell. Now, final thoughts for us to ponder on. First, we have to love God, love our country, love yourself and your family, and definitely love our professional solidarity. We as nurses must be united. And thank you for listening to my presentation. I'm now open to ask. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bustamante. That was, again, very inspiring and uh, noteworthy in the effect that it, it will provide information about what is the PNRSI and what is nursing research as far as Philippine nursing is concerned. Um, any updates that you would like to do? Dr. Bustamante. I was there. Okay, so I, I think this nurses will just have to be united during these times, especially because it's very necessary not only to do research, but also to practice our profession skills. Right. Um, I, would, I, would, uh, uh, I would assume that there will be our, we have 79 participants uh, right now, and that is a very good number. And I would expect these uh, participants to, uh, perhaps write down your questions uh, and ask them at the appropriate time. Actually, now 81. All right. So um, after all those three presentations, we would like to we would like responses uh, or commentaries from from uh, from uh, I would say uh, dignitaries. I'd like to say so. Pre-recorded presentations. Uh, we have three celebrated experts. All right. And so we have uh, Fitz um, Gerald Jaminit, or Haminit, sorry, uh, Johanna Zehender, and Jonathan Moniz, right? So there, uh, you can see their um, slide, and then they will, they will present themselves uh, appropriately, okay. Greetings to all the participants of this Philippine Nursing Town Hall meeting. And I was tasked to give commentary on the discussion of Dr. Linda Buhan, which is improving public understanding of the importance of safe staffing. So the discussion was good, which focused on the different principles of staffing. It showed also the challenges of the current Philippine nursing staff. So staffing focuses on the on how do we dis distribute the manpower in a nursing unit, and as per the discussion, good staffing number amounts to safe and quality nursing care, and which may it's improve five patient outcomes. However, based on the challenges, it was shown there that there is an increase in the turnover rates of the nurses from the year 2017, or even earlier so part of the cause of the turnover rate is the migration of nurses abroad and some that i think i can identify is the number of nurses which are not working in the clinical setting be it in the community or in the hospital so for example nursing nur nurses who are working on the uh, bpo companies which which they are employed to be as medical coders or medical transcriptionists. And those nurses who are in the academy, okay? So there are 
different uh, fields these nurses which are working on. So part also of the decrease in the number of nurses in the clinical setting is that there is a decrease in the number of enrollment. Uh, if we can remember, uh, maybe in the late 2010s, the Commission on Higher Education discouraged students to take up nursing as their bachelor's degree since there is an oversupply of nurses from the year 2006 or maybe up to 2010. So there, then it starts the marked decrease in the enrollees of nursing schools from the year 20, about 2015 up to the present. So in terms of the K-12 to or the shift of the educational system from a 10-year basic education to 12-year basic education also impacted the enrollees of the college or bachelor's degree in nursing, which later on we will be feeling in the years to come for this coming 2021 and 2022 wherein there is a very marked decrease in the number of graduating students with bachelor's degree in nursing. So my concern now is how do we uh, address these challenges of the decrease in the enrollment in the nursing students and of course uh, increase in the turnover rates because of maybe these nurses are looking for better opportunities abroad. So one that I can think of is that we increase the promotion of we increase the promotion to those licensed nurses to come back to the nursing profession. So maybe these returnees would be there there for fulfilling their nursing dreams and nursing careers later on as they go back into the clinical setting. So Another one is that we hope that we can uh, recommend to the Commission on Higher Education to make the nursing program a priority program so that local universities and colleges, including the state colleges, can promote nursing as a degree of choice for those incoming uh, college students. Uh, my question for Dr. Buhat now is that with the number of the staff in the hospital which is very low at the moment and with the present situation of increase in the number of patients can we integrate or how can we integrate the modalities of care that we can use as nurses to the number of staff that is present on the healthcare setting yeah, okay. Um, in 2019, January, we had a forum of chief nursing officers primarily to discuss the, um, the staffing. And because, um, you know, if we only rely on the primary care of um, care for nurses, uh, we really do not have, we don't have enough nurses. So we discuss on any modalities like functional nursing or team nursing or the use of unlicensed professional like nursing aid just to, to the, um, focus, focus the, nursing, the nurses to do the nursing job. And uh, the chief nursing officers were able to navigate in their own areas just to uh, comply with um, safe care to patients and I think we were successful in that um, we use not only other modalities but strategies on uh, in scheduling and also in um, giving them the um, support and uh, we discussed this with um, the Philippine Hospital Association we discussed this with the Philippine, ha the PHAPI, which is the private hospitals uh, organization in the Philippines. We discussed this with DOLE because the DOLE is requiring only eight hours 
for 40 hours a week. And we discussed that as long as we comply with the law, which is 40 hours a week. And then we do, so, do some uh, tweak in our scheduling. Then it will be, you know, fine with them. We discuss this with the Department of Health, the licensing, so that we will not be against the law. And I think we were able to, to in more or less, uh, respond to the needs of our chief nurses. Thank you very much, Dr. Buha. Right. Um, so we, we, may, we will be sure to record what you have just presented and perhaps uh, disseminate that, not perhaps, but disseminate that information to, to everyone, all right? So remember, all those who are listening actively, we will have highlights of this presentation by uh, uh, Dr. Cindy Lee, Professor Lee, at the end of this um, town hall meeting. So now we will have uh, Johanna Sehender. Uh, Dr. Akub, please uh, read uh, her commentaries. Okay, thank you. So the line reads, and I quote, from Johanna Zihander, a writer and grappler contributor. To be a general in an army, one must know and experience what it feels like to be a soldier first. That's how a chief nursing officer or chief nurse in most hospitals should be. While a CNO must indeed have the required qualifications and experiences, he or she must also have a heart for all the nurses under his or her leadership and the willingness to work as a team player with other hospital departments in the delivery of healthcare services. While the idea for an independent nursing office or department in hospitals and other settings is a welcome change, there are pitfalls in being too independent where a nurse must risk encroaching on another field or going beyond his scope of practice. The better word for how the nursing service must function is interdependent, which uses a team approach in the making and giving health services. The hospital chief, the chief residents of all medical departments, the heads of other departments along with the CNO, and hospital administrators must also work together harmoniously in the delivery of compassionate and competent patient care. At this trying time, especially now that our fellow nurses with work applications abroad are fighting for the lifting of the current deployment ban for all healthcare workers, it is a must more than ever to stand united as nurses and be heard. If we could only unite as a one group, then we wouldn't have to suffer and struggle apart from each other. As far as I know about our nursing groups in the country, aside from the BON and ANSAP, we have PNA, FNU, and the ANAR Sparklerists, each with their unique contributions and efforts in trying to make the lives of Filipino nurses better. Doctors have the PMA, and it's also that same association responsible for licensing, conventions, and media statements. So with this in mind, there are two questions being raised, and this question is addressed to Dr. Pakis. The first one is, is it possible to just have one main group to serve the needs and interests of Filipino nurses? And the second is, can a CNO function without encroaching or crossing the medical chief's duties? Dr. Pakis? So what is the first question? The first, uh, the first question is? Uh, is it possible to just have one main group to interest of Filipino nurses? Yes, as what you have said, if we will work together, we can help, we can unite. But the thing is, I think this is a Shangri-La for us at this moment. Okay, thank you. The, the second, and for the be, next question. Yes. Can a chief nursing officer function without encroaching or crossing the medical chief's duties? 
course. Yes, what we have discussed in, in today and what we have put in the bills is that for nurses, it should be the chief nursing officer who should be their leader. It should never be the medical director, but it should be the chief nursing officer who should handle all the nursing aspects in a certain institution. But right, we should really work together. We should interlink with them because we, we cannot work alone, but the leader of the nurses should be a nurse too. Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pakis. Well said. All right. Um, now we, we, we would like to move forward and have uh, the um, video presentation by Jonathan Moniz. First of all, congratulations to the team behind the nursing town hall meeting. This is a great platform to discuss new developments in the nursing practice. Thank you and congratulations to Dr. Irma Bustamante for this presentation providing a basic understanding on how nursing research is being done in the country. I really like the simple diagram demonstrating how nursing research leads to better health outcomes through influencing. I have a few comments and questions from this presentation. So first, I feel that researchers are thinking more about the different methods and different topics to study on. Well, policymakers are discussing on how to improve health outcomes through policy and programmatic measures. The bridge towards evidence-based decision-making lacks attention to. So this includes activities maximizing the political economy of nursing, such as advocacy, coalition building, networking, and influencing. So this area is important because it puts forward the nursing research agenda to the table of our policymakers. So given this, how do we encourage nurse researchers to work in this area of study? So second, given the current pandemic, I believe a new nursing research agenda has to be developed. Number one, to compile and put forward the lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. Number two, to adapt to the new normal situation because the health-seeking behavior of our clients changed and shifted dramatically. So people are afraid to go out because they are afraid of getting infected of COVID. There is a massive, massive demand for digital health nowadays. So how does the nursing sector prepare for this? How do we shape the nursing research agenda, creating more spaces and more budget for innovation and digital health? Lastly, there is a need to strengthen our risk management in the nursing practice by developing systems and processes to respond to the worst case scenarios. The nursing sector should work hand in hand and should partner with other sectors in developing a contingency plan for current and future disasters. So to end this point, while we live in a high risk, highly volatile environment, there are opportunities we can maximize as we move forward and as we heal as a one nursing sector. Thank you and congratulations again to the team. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that was a, a very uh, incisive presentation of um, uh, Dr. Monis or Mr. Monis, actually. All right. And so um, we shall now have uh, the live uh, reactions. We have three experts. All right. Uh, the commentaries were celebrated commentators. We shall now hear comments and reactions from distinguished experts. We have three: uh, Maria Isabel Bel Rogado, which I think most of you know. Uh, she is the CCNAPI or the Critical Care Nurses Association of the Philippines Incorporated National President. We have David Hali de Jesus, uh, our NPH, Director of Nursing, Hamad Medical Corporation, uh, Qatar, probably Doha, Qatar. 
Uh, Jomar Maravilla, Dr. Maravilla, is a postdoctoral fellow, University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, shall we hear from Dr. Uh, from? Thank yeah. you. I lost my connection. Sorry for that. No problem. Okay. Okay. So first and foremost, thank you very much for the opportunity to take part in this particular town hall meeting pertaining particularly as a reactor to staffing. And of course, I would like to relate my reaction to the current state of the global world, which is affected and uh, suffering from COVID-19 pandemic. Now, I highly affirm and acknowledge what our good speaker, Dr. Maria Linda Buhat, had said regarding the principles, recommendations, challenges that support the safe staffing and how also it affects safe staffing. Now, what I admire is her emphasis that the adherence to these principles and guidelines may not really be implemented in most of the Philippine hospitals. Therefore, it is not a reality. Now, this particular dream reality has become more pronounced, particularly now in the time of our COVID pandemic. Now, we can see snapshots of the present scenario affecting healthcare human resources particularly nursing in the news and even nurses in the social media. Now, scenarios on the disruption of an already enduring staffing allocation has been affected by factors such as mm -hmm. availability of application that would bring our nurses to and from the workplaces, the discrimination and bullying to the extent of being physically mauled and even evicted from their rental dwellings, being quarantined, due to exposure and even contracting the virus, and of course, the unfortunate demise of some of our nurses. Now, we are all informed about the third COVID-19 related that tremendously affects and common pathologies that we Now, definitely, this has a big impact in the availability of capable nurses to meet care of the yeah, Now, this scenario is compounded by the lack of resources yeah. such as the PPE, ICU beds, and ventilators, among others. However, let me just say that I am still thankful that most hospital leaders, together with their nursing counterparts, were quick in responding to this new normal and have immediately addressed needs and concerns of healthcare workers, particularly that of their patients. Now, provisions for transportation, accommodation, including quarantine facilities, and food by some, if not most of the hospital. Incentives such as increasing hazard pay, groceries, and other perks were even given by, again, some hospitals. PPEs were acquired through government support and mass campaign, restructuring of hospital services and systems, segregating the clean cases against the COVID cases were implemented, and even cross-training of nurses to augment staffing in COVID census were rapidly done. Now, at the same time, the Department of Health initiative on emergency hiring was also in place. Now, this challenge of the pandemic brought the opportunity for a renewed synergy by welcoming innovation, empowerment, teamwork, collaboration, partnership, and even sharing. And definitely, these were all built on the, the resilience that patients and nurses in particular have shown the world. However, we still have to address much bigger issues now in this time of pandemic. But most of our nurses are now suffering moral distress, burnt out, and even ethical challenges of irregular long shifts, diverse roles, and even end-of-life scenarios and decisions. Now, when we look at this particular uh, direction towards a stable new normal, this current pandemic, COVID pandemic, will greatly influence nursing. And at this point, I would like to present some of the questions that I have in my mind. Will the COVID experience incite a young to be recruited to take up nursing? Will we be able to retain our nurses in our own hospital 
and even in our own country? How far will the nursing leadership and hospital leadership, including government and public, support this nightingale who frontline the fight of the pandemic virus? When will our nurses sit on the on the national policy making table to address the needs of our nurses and to fight for our nurses? And who will care for these caring nurses? Now in ending, I would like to restate with a twist what Dr. Buhat had said in her final final statement. We are first and foremost human beings caring for human beings and deserve and we long for nurturing and caring too. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. Thank you very much, Bill. All right. uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak about uh, caring and human humanness. So thank you very much. I, I still remember your, your painting, so wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, and those are excellent questions, by the way. So hopefully uh, we get we get to uh, encourage other people to really ask those questions, and hopefully we can find ways to answer those questions. Right yeah. now we will have we will have uh, David Hali De Jesus for a nurse, Doctor De Jesus. Doctor De Jesus, please. Hi, hello, good afternoon. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hi, hi, Dr. Jesus. Yeah, uh, thank you for the invitations uh, to the organizing committee, distinguished guests, Lily. Good morning to all of you. Now, uh, what I'd like to look and emphasize is on the presentation of Dr. Pakis. You know, it yeah. really, it really had made me realize that we still have a long way to go. You know, the presentation of Dr. Pakis has made it through the elements was concise, the concepts were indeed very beneficial. And for that, I'd like to express my salutations to you, Dr. Spakis, and my admiration to Angler Spakis, and also to your leadership. Now, having said this, uh, we talk about nursing leadership on who should lead onto it, you know. There are many terminologies that we have looked into, many admins, uh, terminologies, some would say director of nursing, some would use chief nurses, some would use CNO. Well, to this extent, this level of leadership is all the same. They still man nurses in all aspects in the four corners of the hospital. Well, I'll just express my comment on this uh, based on my experience of 19 years in the Middle East. Well, I was starting in 2001. I joined a hospital where in the culture of nurses still has to report to the medical director. They hired me for becoming, to become a director of nursing, and it was a real challenge. At the time, there were still no standard decisions of a law that requires all hospitals must have chief nursing officers. So with that law setting aside, I still did not stop on putting up that kind of drive, that journey that we want to be on autonomy in terms of running our nursing affairs. And to the support of the hospital administrator, which is the hospital CEO, we then had a separation between medical directors and the nursing director's organizational chart. That's one achievement I'd like to express, and that made us an identity in the four corners of that hospital. Now, when we talk about coming into the law, having that standardization in 2003, there was in one of the Middle East countries I visited and I worked with, they had tried to compile a law that requires any hospitals must have a director of nursing with a minimum requirement. And that is by point system. No hospital will be given license to operate without that essential nursing chapters, which is either can be John JCI, can be John Hopkins, can either be central board accreditation or in any other sorts of central organization or central accrediting body. I talk about this because these are very important things and the minimum requirements is really essential for us to move further where we want to lead our nurses. 
in the hospital. And I firmly believe, and I'm with Dr. Patis, when says CNO must lead nurses. We will collaborate. We will cooperate with the doctors. But let us have that identity that as nurses will be reporting to the nursing directors. Now, when we talk about directing, organizing, managing, planning, and controlling, that are very essential. Now, with what Dr. Patis had made mention about one story in Capis Leite, it is to our dismay that we hear such one of those organizations discredit one nursing director. It feels bad because her incompetence marks the generalization of all the CNO in the, in the, in the place. Well, let us try to talk to ourselves, have that inner reflections. When we nurses, we want to be one, we can be the best that we can be, you know. I think that the failure of one has not to be amongst all. It has to be not generalized. If that isolated incident, that, that reflection should not be then carried out to other organizations. The very corners and the very point I want to express is we nurses, really, we shine. Okay. And uh, what the vetoed happened with the Philippine Hospital Association and Senator Bigno, it was really something that we can't accept. And with the questions of some who put out the representation of Professor Takis being represented in duly elected, is also an attack to the very common voice of the nurses. Imagine somebody who is questioning the authority of our nurse past parties, which is out many nurses behind it, is also questioning the very voice of the nurses. So for me, I like what she did on the call of her actions, and I'm with her. So for my final say, I would express to Dr. Parkis, where are we now with the current administration in terms of fighting nurses' rights on salary and CNO? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. De Jesus. And um, uh, very interesting commentaries. And I am sure uh, Dr. Pakis will say something about it. And so now we should have uh, Dr. Maravilla, a uh, postdoctoral fellow, University of Queensland, Australia. Dr. Maravilla, please. Um, good evening or good afternoon or good morning to everyone. Um, I, I would just like to thank um, the fine network just really inviting me to, um, I, I would say, react or share my thoughts regarding Dr. Bustamante's um, presentation. I found, well, I found the presentation really, really informative and um, as, as, as a researcher, it's really, and I guess it's a researcher who does a lot of um, evidence synthesis. Um, it's it's really really good that you know nurse the nursing res the field of nursing research is really expanding um, beyond the field of care empathy and moving really towards um, biomedical research innovation um, palliative care medical surgical nursing. Um, I really agree that a lot of some of the emerging fields in research, and not just in nursing, but even in other fields of health sciences, um, that mental health um, data collection in, within sensitive populations, looking at social or societal impacts, even the social determinants of health, um, it are one, a few of the emerging research um, fields, um, especially in the wake of COVID-19. Um, but then, um, my my thought in, in terms of not just with the emerging re fields of research, but also with those fields with saturated amount of um, evidence. Um, I guess my thought in, in that sort of um, field is, uh, or those fields um, is that, you know, where are we in terms of dissemination? I really appreciate that, you know, nursing professionals, nursing researchers are really proactive in terms of publication. But I, I really thought that um, apart from publishing papers, it's really important for us to have a good dissemination plan by involving relevant stakeholders, um, whether it's hospital, um, clinics, small or big clinics within our community, um, also non-government organizations, um, professional organizations within the nursing field, um, as well as um, um, government agencies as well. Do we have 
a clear, I guess that's a question not just for the nursing society, but even for all the nurse researchers, um, is that, you know, do we have a clear dissemination plan? Have we, also another thing is, have we engage stakeholders, not just during the time that we're done with our research, but, but even during the conception or when we were when we're developing our research design or our research questions, it's really really important that we consider the needs of our community apart from of, of course our own um, um, need for I guess answers to some of our questions um, or in research interests. But it's really important as well to know what the needs of our community, what are the needs of our community in terms of evidence, um, and. Um, Another thing, and I guess once we really um, put ourselves in that sort of stakeholder engagement, I think, um, which is also in line with uh, Sir Jonathan's comments a while ago, I think that's where we will have some presence in policymaking. Um, and I guess in, in policymaking, let, let us not just be involved in terms of consultation, let, let us be proactive in terms of really pushing um, new information um, up-to-date evidence, quality evidence to improve nursing practice and even the quality of care um, in the quality of care in the in nursing field. Um, and then another thing as well that I had some thoughts um, is that you know although we 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 are really um, contributing a lot in terms of evidence generation, knowledge generation. I think this is the time we're in we should really pursue translational research. You know, we should look as nurses, especially, especially those who are providing services, or not just in the academy, but even those who are in the field. I think it's important for us to be really involved in implementation science. It's important for us to be involved on in how this enormous amount of evidence will be translated into our own practice or to our own sort of um, institution. Um, so I think that's something that's somehow emerging in the field um, or should be focused in the field as well as we um, have an, a saturated amount of evidence in some of the specific fields in nursing. Um, I guess my, my, my que one, in relation to that, my question is um, to Dr. Bustamante is that, um, what 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 would be what are what is the extent of translational research or i guess but not necessarily translational research but translational activities among our um filipino um researchers because that's something that um i guess should be really highlighted how do we push for for the enormous amount of work we're doing um we don't want our research definitely just to sit in bookshelves or in repositories we want it to be out and influencing policies and programs. Um, last, my last thought is, um, um, I guess with capacity building, um, I really, well, being based in Australia, I'm not much aware of the different capacity building initiatives for nurse researchers or emerging researchers. But I thought that, you know, the nursing, um, society is really good in terms of providing a lot of capacity building activities, a lot of avenues to promote um, the works of our different um, emerging and um, um, expert researchers. Um, but if one of my question is, I guess, in terms of capacity building, knowing that there's, a, there's already some initiatives in, in capacity building, how do we actually sustain those programs um, and not just sustaining in the long term how do we actually transfer those capacities particularly um, not just in academic institutions but even for hospitals and other industry um, organizations because you know only few people are being trained um, to do research or, or very few people are competent in producing or doing research or even interpreting research so I think it's important as well for us to think about how do we, um, I guess, spread that sort of expertise within those um, organizations. So I think that's just a um, few of my thoughts. And another, sorry, one last thing is that, you know, speaking of capacity building, how does um, the nursing, the Philippine nursing, look into the value of students as well? I feel like 
the students really have a major role in producing evidence. And well, they, well I, I think we should really highlight their value um, in the field of research, that their research is not just something that, that, that is being done for the sake of requirement. I think they should, they should also feel the value of the, the research work they're doing by mentoring or even exposure to, um, I guess, industry or people who would use their own research. So I've, I'm just wondering, um, what are the different strategies for us even to, to encourage or motivate our, our emerging researchers? Um, so that's just a few of my thoughts. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Maravilla. Um, you you uh, gave uh, important points regarding um, the politics of nursing, uh, administrative practice, his uh, perspective as well as emphasizing knowledge development. Now, I would like to ask um, uh, Dr. Bustamante uh, to, to respond uh, for, for one minute, if, if, if at all possible. Um, Irma, Dr. Bustamante. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can. I heard. Okay, thank you very much, Jomer. Can I just call you Jomer? Maravilla, oh, doctor. Yes, would you yes, like a more formal doctor, Maravilla? Oh no, just call me Jomer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So first, the most important thing that we have to do to sustain and to encourage people to do research, not only the students, but also the professional, is to befriend them when we are tutoring them, because many of those who are knowledgeable in research act as though they're the best. So they don't befriend. They 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 put them down. The best is to make them their friends. And if you're becoming friends, then it's easy to influence them. Now about the translational research that you're mentioning, it's just, uh, we are in the newborn state actually, because we are still beginning. Many nurses still do not know how to do translational research, much less even evidence-based practice. If you look at the hospitals, they're not doing it the way it should be done, right? And about involving stakeholders, it's very important that we talk like in evidence-based practice. We look at the literatures, we look at our expertise, and we look at what our patients and those that we serve tell us. And we combine them together to be able to know what should be done to do research. But I think the most important to sustain research is just to be with them on a friendly basis. We should not be in an ivory tower, you know? Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bustamante. Thank you so much for the for the encouragement. All right. And um, I am sure Jomer and uh, and you will 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 have an opportunity to discuss these things further and perhaps influence our nursing research in the Philippines as well. Um, at this juncture, uh, we would like. Um, I think the last text that I had was that um, uh, Joel, uh, Dr. Akob, and. Yes. Yes, yes, doctor. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, before we proceed with live Q and A from our audience, let me read to you a question or a rejoinder from one of the faculty of Cebu Doctors University, uh, Professor Joseph Andrew Pepito. The line reads: uh, Doing research should pr be promoted in nursing, especially at this time. We are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution and technologies of caring is drastically changing how nursing is done. More research is needed for transition of nursing into the fourth industrial revolution. Researches on maintaining the caring component of nursing in a highly technological healthcare system is important. I believe that we have need we have this need to know now to promote research in nursing is to reach out to organizations and individuals who are interested in research but do not know how to start. Our best foot forward should be making knowledge more accessible and we have a lot of researchers who are willing to guide other nurse researchers. The challenge is establishing a connection between those nurse researchers Nurses are not inclined to do research because they do not know how to start to begin with. Imagine if those nurses have access to a mentor. That would increase confidence and enable nurses. A good mentorship program would be a good place to start 
in order to promote research in nurses, end of line. So that's from Professor Tepito of CDU. Uh, I think, and any reaction for that before we proceed with our Q&A? We'll have to welcome Dr. Bautista, uh, Dr. Robert Bautista from the US. But before that, any reaction from that a question or rejoinder? Hello. So yes. I believe we have to we have to really inform nurses of the value of research. But nowadays, many nurses are becoming interested in research. Would you believe? In fact, when when we were trying to do some conventions, many nurses would really want to join and do researches. But the difficulty is there should really be enough administrative support. Okay. Without okay. that. Difficult to move. Yes, yeah, so I also agree with you to that extent, Dr. Batis. I mean, Irma, thank you for that. Um, for now, we will uh, accommodate Dr. Robert Bautista, who is now in the US, for, her, for his insights and questions. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Robert. I'm a nurse based in the University of Texas at Austin doing health information research. Um, in terms of capacity building, um, I've had several research talks in the Philippines. I even made one um, appearance in the Philippine Nursing Research um, Society convention. Um, there really needs to be some sort of capacity building before we can move on to uh, translational research. I think the most important thing is to do capacity building. I had experiences consulting hospitals in terms of their nursing research. And the first thing that I always ask is that how supportive is their nursing office is in terms of doing research. Um, I always ask this question because um, you really need to provide time and support and even funding for nurses to do research. So I did some consultancy for both public and private. And what we usually found what I personally found is that administrative support is really important. Like, for instance, um, you ask nurses to take, um, take one day from their clinical work to be for them to be assigned to do research. You cannot put research on top of their already heavy workload. And there needs to be some sort of, um, sort of reward. Where, for instance, when we did some research, their reward was attending a conference and they actually liked the prospects of attending an, uh, a conference like the um, the nursing research con uh, Philippine nursing research conference that we have in the Philippines so I think um, capacity building is important and during in during the time that I'm doing some capacity building in terms of nursing I always mention that um, I'm a person that they don't really know much about research and this is something that you can learn and I'm very appreciative towards Dr. Irma's way of saying that um, we don't need uh, we shouldn't we should avoid um, looking up researchers as somewhat in the ivory tower um, we need to humanize research it means that re doing research is something that even a person a uh, simple person can actually do with the right guidance so I think um, administrative support guidance and providing some resources for Filipino nurses is very important in terms of doing research. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. All right. And um, uh, let me see, our live Q&A will, will follow. So uh, can we ask um, uh, anyone perhaps uh, to initiate the question and answer? We have our three experts. Who are who are presented our eminent guests rather, and we have approximately uh, uh, ten minutes uh, to do the uh, Q and A. Okay, uh, Doctor Luxine, uh, someone is raising her hand. We have. Oh, sorry. Okay, go yeah. ahead, uh, Joel. Can you can you okay. address that because I cannot. Okay, see. so we acknowledge uh, Miss Arlene Navarro from Saudi Arabia. Mom, uh, um, Mr. Arlene, Mr. Arlene Navarro. <laughs> okay, 
Um, I'm Arlina Baru po from uh, Saudi Arabia, the CNO also of uh, One Hospital here in Saudi, and the assistant project manager and the past president of the Philippine nurses here in the uh, eastern province of Saudi Arabia also. Um, uh, hindi lang po ako magtatanong, may reaction din ako kung mamarapating niyo po at ako inyong papayagan. Um, Doon lang po ako sa kung ano ngayon ang nangyayari at kung ano ang napapanahon. Um, empowered, yun po yung malaking katanungan. Pagkakaisa or unity. Asa na nga po ba yung sinasabi nating unity pagdating sa Pinoy nurses? Sa dinami-dami ng organisasyon ng ating profesyon, pero tila may kanya-kanya po kasi tayong agenda. Kaya parang hindi tayo napapakinggan dahil may iba't iba tayong isinisigaw sa gobyerno. Hindi ba't mas magandang makita ang pagkakaisa na may iisang boses? Puntahan po natin yung napakatagal na na panahon na walang pagpapahalaga sa nurses. At ngayon dahil lang dito sa COVID, nakita natin yung mga iba't ibang pangako na dapat sana noon pa ginawa. Madali para sa mga nurses na matatanggap kung naging maganda ang pagtrato nila noong wala pa ang COVID. Tapos may magsasabi na patriotism. Ang kapalit po ba ng patriotism eh overworked, underpaid, unappreciated. Ito pong ating mga sinasabi na empowerment, teamwork. Sa ngayon, hindi po natin makikita sa ating mga nurses. We are gearing up to the more research. Pero paano po magiging uh, um, kaaya-aya at katanggap-tanggap para sa ating mga Pinoy nurses na gawin. Kung kulang naman yung empowerment na ibinibigay ng dapat magbigay nito. Puntahan din po natin yung yung pagrerebisa nung nung siguro nung ating curriculum ng nursing kasi ang ngayon po nakita natin sa COVID. Nakita natin ang dami-dami na ngayong mga accreditations hindi lang sa ibang bansa lalo na sa Pilipinas. Mas maganda. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll give you five more seconds, please. Thank okay. you, sir. Sana po makita na i-add ang infection control sa curriculum plus yung ating quality management. Ihanda po natin ang ating mga estudyante. And the okay. CNL, please support the CNL kasi yun po yung kailangan ng mga nursing uh, chief nursing officers. Thank you sure. so much, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Navarro. All right. Uh, Joel, you have another one? Okay, so button. anybody from the room for Ericsson Button? You, you, uh, Ericsson Button is uh, raising his hand. Okay, Mr. Button, you are you are recognized. Yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, uh, my question is regarding um someone from the speaker have talked about um the undersupply of nurses and one of the reason for that is that we have nurses who are outside of the practice and one of the uh, things that we can improve on is to pull them back into nursing practice so my question is how do we support these nurses who have been out of the practice five years ten years and then we're pulling them back in the nursing i, I understand that upper hospital, um, that's that's a challenge for them, but as a national um, nursing, as an, in the national sense, how do we um, help them? Um, I think um, from, I don't know who, who is um, able to answer this from um, our speaker. Yes, uh, Mr. Batan, thank you very much. I think, um, uh, let me see, uh, Dr. Buhat can, can probably answer that question because he, she is in the uh, nursing administration section. So you're talking about practice. So uh, Dr. Buhat, please, one, one minute, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Actually, uh, since we are 
dearth of nurses. We don't have applicants because uh, in 2006, most of the nurses went to other fields like BPO. So now we are uh, encouraging them to go back to nursing. So what we do is this skilling, you know, we have to, because they forget already the skills, they have the knowledge probably. So we have a program and, uh, that uh, will um, uh, help these nurses regain their skill again in the basic nursing care. And um, I think most of the hospital is doing that already. And uh, we are encouraging all those who are not in the field of nursing anymore to come back. As a matter of fact, based on our studies, that there are more BPO and uh, those nurses in McDonald's and Jollibee came back and uh, they apply in the hospital. And then, you know, it will take a, a while, a month or two, before they can really be comfortable taking care of the patient anymore already. So I think that's being done. And um, I think uh, the, the response is also good. Basically, the salary of the nurses in the government is already good. The issue here actually is the, the private hospital. Because if I am, you know, in the BPO, I am earning this much. So we discussed this with the PHP, which is the private hospitals owners, and they were um, actually accepting the fact that they have to increase the salary of the nurses. Few hospitals now have increased the salary of their nurses, and I'm happy for that. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Buhat. Well said, right? And there's always this idea of retraining, or I would probably use the word re-educating, right, rather than retraining. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bazan. Thank you. Okay, any more questions from the group? I've seen one. We have from Christine Lozano. Maybe I have to go directly to her query. Uh, why can't the government give us a reason to stay rather than harassing or coercing us to abandon quote-unquote chances of better employment options outside the country by implementing a travel ban? All right. Thank you very much yes. for that question, Ms. Lozano. Um, uh, Dr. Pakis, please. Shall we have Dr. Pakis? We know for a fact that our healthcare delivery system is fragmented. Since the revolution in 1990, um, the leadership of the health workers went to the, doc, went to the governors and mayors, but the money or the salaries didn't go down. And in the LGUs today, our nurses are job orders. And in the private hospitals, our nurses, their starting salary is minimum wage. And in the government today, in the DOH, our nurses' salary grade is 11. And that is why we fought for salary grade 15. So we need to work for this. Like in dollar, I'm asking the secretary now, because there are only two categories of workers in dollar, in the private institutions. It's agricultural and non-agricultural. I am now, I have a letter to him to make a different category for health workers. Okay. And for LGUs, we need to work with them. Right. Thank and for the SDCP in the Supreme Court. Right. Thank you very much. That's it. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Pakis. Um, all right. Shall we have, uh, so Ms. Lusano, if you have further questions, please uh, continue to communicate with Dr. Pakis. All right. Uh, Dr. Jacob, uh, uh, Jacob, do we have any other questions? I saw a question from um, Mr. Navarro. So uh, anyway, if any, any yeah. other questions, please? Uh, so far, we do not have uh, questions raised by our audience. This, I think this is a follow-up question from uh, Mr. Navarro. Like he's trying to affirm if it's really uh, the private hospitals are now adapting to the increase of salary. Okay. Uh, okay, so... Uh, so, Dr. Think, yes. 
Dr. Buhat, uh, 10 seconds, please. I th you, you just need to reiterate, I think. Yes. Some hospitals already have increased the salary of their nurses. Right. Thank and you. I think this is the G15 thing, right? So thank you. Thank you very much. So Mr. Navarro, please continue to communicate with Dr. Buhat if you, if you get a chance, okay? All right. Um, any other questions, perhaps, or from the audience? We have 74 participants online. Okay, we have one from Mr. Uh, Byron Opinion. And his question is, is there any possibility for nurses who can be enrolled to any insurance benefit as a requirement for hospitals when they are hired? Um, uh, repeat that, uh, Dr. Akko, please. Uh, is, there, is there any possibility for nurses who can be enrolled to any insurance benefit as a requirement for hospitals when they are hired? I think there's something to do about insurance. All right, uh, Dr. Buhat, please. <laughs> uh, we would like that. As a matter of fact, there were offers already from the insurance uh, company that uh, nurses will be insured, but there are no takers yet. And uh, it's not very popular in the Philippines. And we would like that. We are encouraging them. We posted that in our FB and in advisories of ANSAP that if they can also have uh, a way to insure our nurses, and that's better. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Well, well, well said. Thank you. All right. Um, anything else? Any questions? Um, mm. Dr. Akko, because... Um, okay, we one, I think this, this will be our last uh, question before we end. Uh, this is from Galaxy J4 Plus. Uh, the purpose why she's joining uh, this afternoon is to know more on the updates for healthcare deployment ban. Uh, she said that she is unemployed for more than a year now because of the processing she had for her application abroad. Now, due to deployment ban, she tried to apply to hospital again. But sad to say, hospitals will not hire her because they want nurses who will stay. So her question is, so why not the government let us go, especially those who are unemployed? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, can we have uh, Dr. Pakis? Uh, 30 seconds, please. I'm sorry, we have to, you know. We are working on that now. We have a letter to the president and we are we will try to go to the Supreme Court. Right. Thank you so much. That's very important. And that's a very uh, uh, promising, promising question, actually, as far as that is concerned. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Uh, anything Anything else? I think, um, Dr. Akob? Yeah, so far, Doc, we don't have uh, any more questions from the chat room. Okay. So... Yes. Can we do your closing remarks, please? Yes. Uh, before that, let me acknowledge the presence of our... We have Dr. Jesus from Qatar, Dr. Bautista from the U.S., Dr. James Reblando from UAE. We have uh, Mr. Francis Opinion from Bahrain, and we have also a participant from Ireland, Mr. Jemmy Almodovar. Okay, thanks for joining. Uh, I think it looks, uh, we've covered all our questions. And at this point, may we hear highlighting words from one of our distinguished partners and allow me to mention some of her features. She is a senior lecturer for more than 30 years now at the Australian Catholic University School of Nursing and Midwifery and Paramedicine. She chaired the school's research committee and also spearheaded the Committee on Internationalization. Prior to her career in Australia, she then served as assistant professor of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and as a special assistant to the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. She obtained her PhD in molecular genetics at the School of Biotechnology, University of New South Wales, Australia. Colleagues and friends, the Director for Professional Development of the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, Dr. Cindy Lane. Dr. Hello. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Doc. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm Dr. Cindy Lee, and I know that everybody in the forum or in the meeting has already been sitting and focusing and concentrating for the past two hours. And we literally have a two hour limit for our town hall meeting today. Now, so my role is to actually to provide you with the highlights of what has transpired during our town hall meeting. I know that you have been with us from the beginning at the, uh, two o'clock Manila time. So what I have done is to actually put together um, highlights for you plus the commentaries given by the different um, invited commentators as well as the question and answers that was raised on the floor. Now, since we do not have the time for that, what I will be doing is to actually write this out in a, a most readable outline because I know you're all busy. And we will upload this in our um, website, Find Network website, if that is okay to everyone. And if there is anything missing from what I have written, then everybody is free to actually go and bring their comments or suggestions in that particular document. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm now handing back to our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Joel Akob, for his closing of our meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cindy. For and in behalf of the conveners of the first Philippine Nursing Town Hall meeting, our partners, the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, ang NARS Partilist, the Philippine Nursing Research Society, the Beta Nu Delta, our eminent resource persons and final reactors and commentators, active participants across the globe, we appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for sharing this wonderful and scholarly experience. This recording will be made available to our social media sites. Would you mind looking the Facebook page of the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining and see you on the next Philippine Nursing Town Hall meeting. Before we leave, I'm encouraging everyone to please uh, uh, I mean, open your video. video or yes for the photo, group photo. All the participants. Yeah. Yes. Let's have a posterity shot, everyone, guys. <laughs> Okay. Thank you.